We are live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we are going to be talking about wood. I know, we never talk about wood, do we? This is going to be kind of fun. <laughs> uh, it's among the more common questions I get of what is the best wood to use for Project X. Um, and a lot of times that is a difficult answer to, qu answer to question, question to answer. So today I want to actually go through what I think about when I choose wood for project. And the answer is white oak. It, it's the answer for everything. Okay, we can be done with the video. Uh, let's uh, see you next week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so no, this is actually, uh, it's a kind of a fun topic because once you understand a few basics, uh, everything kind of clicks into place. And I want to go through a lot of that tonight. Um, so upcoming items. Um, number one, there is, um, uh, let's see, the 10th of August. So coming up in two weeks, I think it is, or three weeks, two weeks. Um, we're going to be doing a live with uh, Rex Kruger. What? Nothing. I'm just oh. looking at you. When you look at me, it usually means I did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> She's got the power. <laughs> well, duh. Um, so we're going to be doing a live with Rex Kruger, and that'll be kind of fun. It'll be spending a good chunk of the time uh, bouncing back and things back and forth. How does he do something? How do I do something? And just kind of uh, messing around. So Bring yes. the shades. Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bald heads unite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see if his wife will uh, get on. And we'll, Ooh, that'd be uh, fun. Kind of interesting. I've never known it. Or grass. Um, so we got that. Uh, oh, and there is the, the Garfield Farm Museum, um, and that is an MWTCA uh, meet, and it's just outside. It's about halfway between here and Chicago, near Schaumburg. Um, and it's really cool. It's actually a farm museum, and so they have, um, well, it's an outdoor museum, but it has farm buildings and implements and things like that. Um, but it's one of my favorite local tool meets, and I tend to find really good user deals there. Um, the first time I went there, there was a guy who had, um, he had a, a, a tarp out on the ground, and on the tarp he had about seven or eight joiners, number seven, number eights, and he was selling them for 20 to $30 a piece. Um, and there were quite a few good deals like that. You don't always see that, but it was, it was well worth it. Um, so if you want to see more about that, you have to be a member of the MWTCA. Actually, for this one, this one you do not have to be a member of the MWTCA. Um, if you go to the, farm, the Garfield Farm Museum, you will be able to come a little later. If you want to be in early, you have to be a member of the MWTCA. Uh, I believe the MWTCA gets in at 6, and everyone else it opens up at 8 o'clock, something like that. Um, and so you can actually come to this one without being a member. Uh, so kind of a, a fun thing. Um, any other upcoming events? Nothing really. We're, uh, yeah, having fun. So um, let's actually jump into this. Um, one of the problems with choosing the best wood for a project is that there is no best wood for the project. Uh, when you think about something like a workbench, um, you will hear all sorts of pundits saying that hard maple is the best wood and others saying no it's a southern yellow a southern white pine and others will say no it's a soft maple and others will say no it must be european beech uh, and the answer is there is no best wood i'm so glad because, you enunciated that uh, yes I have to be very careful <laughs> with the word beach and bench and well, uh winch you said they're a european <laughs> It's like my um, dog getting off the cons. Yeah, so <laughs> rather than picking a best wood for any particular project, usually you want to think about it in terms of what characteristics do I want in the project. So for instance, the workbench. Um, for the workbench, there are some people who want it to be really hard. They want it to be really stiff, so when you pound on it, there's no bounce to it. It feels like pounding on concrete. Uh, it's a very solid, heavy-duty bench. And there's a lot for that. Usually a harder wood is also heavier, so it's not going to be moving around as much. The problem is, if you're working with wood and you're still beginning, a lot of times a board will drop on the bench, and if the bench is too hard, it will dent whatever wood you're working with. So then there's a whole other spectrum that says, ooh, let's make it as soft as possible. And some people really like Douglas fir and other pines. Um, and that way you have a soft bench, so when you drop work on it, the bench dents rather than your work, and that's a very useful thing, but then the bench has a little bit more of a bounce to it. So most people fall somewhere in the, in the category. For me, if I had to pick what I would say is the best wood for a bench, it would probably be a soft maple, something along a, a red maple or a silver maple, um, something of that nature. It's about the right hardness to softness, the right grain density, um, and uh, 
I think that would be what I would pick. But if I'm making a bench for me, I'm going to make it out of white oak. I know that's not what I said would be the best wood for it. I'm going to say it because I love the look of white oak. And I also, I put the side here and the side here, I made those out of something softer. I made them out of walnut. Because walnut's a little softer when something hits the corner, the walnut will dent, but I still have a harder wood in the middle. Um, and so there are lots of things you can think about that way. And that then goes for any project out there, making your rocking chair into you know, your mallets or whatever. There are pros and cons to every wood you pick. Different woods will have different characteristics. So today I want to teach about what those characteristics are and how to look at them. Because sometimes you may be looking at some weird wood that you've never messed with before and you're thinking, what are the characteristics of that? Um, and I want to show you how to, how to actually go and search for those and, and learn about a wood before you jump in and start using it. Or at least have an idea about how it'll work. So the, the most important thing when choosing what wood you want for a project is actually first ask yourself, what wood can I get? Because you can say that European beech is the absolute best wood for this project, but European beech is really, really hard for me to find. Uh, I can find an American beech was a bit softer, um, but in this case, a hard maple would actually be harder. So a hard maple would actually be closer to European beech, even though I can get American beech. And you have to ask yourself, what can you have available? available. So you're going to call up your local Sawyers. That's where I get most of my wood, is I have a list of three or four Sawyers that I've met and, and, and uh, created a relationship with. Um, you'll find them on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace selling slabs and other lumber. Um, and I, I really like creating a, a relationship with them. Downside to that is you're only getting trees that grow locally. So you're not going to be getting much exotics from them because they don't often have some exotic tree that fell in someone's yard. Although occasionally that does come up. Um, yeah, I have, uh, what was the, the one he had? Um, some Japanese pine. Um, some weird thing like that that, he, that someone had been growing as a, uh, a decoration tree and it fell over and he got the trunk from it and, uh, and made lumber out of it. But yeah. Um, the next tier down from a local Sawyer that I normally go to is a hardwood dealer. Uh, and these are a lumber yard that's set aside for hardwoods. He deals in the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, where I'm at, uh, the, the one I probably would go to the most uh, is um, Badger Hardwoods. He's about an hour and a half north of me. And he has a smaller selection. He probably has about 20 to 30 different types of wood that he sells. Uh, the, the main core ones around here are the maple, the walnut, the, uh, the white oak, the red oak. Um, and he has a lot of those, but he'll have a few other less common things, the soft maples, um, and a couple different different types of pine and things like that. But they tend to be a little local or he may have ordered in a trailer load of some type of, type of wood. Um, there's another one that I go to that's outside of Milwaukee. Um, and I can't remember the name, it's just on the south side of Milwaukee. It's about a two hour drive for me. Uh, so it's a bit of a drive, but they've got pretty much everything and they have a lot of really weird things that I can get. Um, so some of the, the exotic things that would be coming from Europe and South America and Africa and the, uh, the islands, um, I can usually get it there. And so that's, that's my tier. And then there are the lumber yards. These are places that sell construction lumber. Generally, I'm going to tell people, don't buy the lumber you're working at a construction store. Either, number one, you're going to be buying pine, which if you're going to be buying pine, that's probably the place to go get it because it's going to be cheap there. But if you're buying hardwoods, from a construction dealer, you're probably gonna be spending too much. The downside to that is a lot of people don't have access to other sources of lumber, and it really requires a lot of looking for those sources of lumber to find those. So all that being said, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is know what lumber you can get. Find your local sources. Um, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, they are fantastic places to try and find uh, local sawyers or local hardwood dealers. Uh, they will, it's actually kind of surprising where some of those pop up and where they are. Um, yeah, so do that, but if you don't, then there's always the construction lumber. Um, any questions so far? Mm. I'm taking a breath. 
Samuel's Custom Builds is just wondering if you're going to cover burls at some point. I will be touching on wood grains and types in that. Okay, that's um, it so far. So it will be coming up. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw them there. I'm going to have two or three little spiels that I'm going to give like that, and then we're going to open it up to, to questions. And so if you have something specific, if I'm making this, what should I work with? Um, then I'd be glad to answer that. So um, you know what wood you have possible. You know where you can get them. Now the question you have to ask yourself is what characteristics are you looking for? And for that, I want to take you over to one of my favorite websites. Uh, and this is uh, the Wood Database. So wood-database.com. Um, and this is a fantastically fun place. So let's try and let's just search here for oak. O-A-K. Oak. Simple one. And in here we've got burl oak, black oak, California, willow, water, swamp, swamp, uh, chestnut, laurel, post. There are lots of different types of oaks. And this will tell you a lot of them. Let's look at, oh, wow, white oak. I've never heard of white oak before. I wonder what, uh, what does that look like? Hmm. <laughs> there's, there's several things you're going to find in here. Number one, probably the most important thing is Jenka hardness. The higher this number is, the harder the wood is. So basically, the way um, the Jenka test is done is they take a, a BB, a round sphere made of metal and a known diameter, and they push it into the wood. And they see how much force does it take to push this into the wood halfway down. And that lets you know how hard the wood is. How, you know, how much work does it take to dent the wood. And that's actually a really good measurement for how durable is it going to be. And so if you're making something like a dining room table, you want something that's going to stand up to an abuse. You got, want something that's going to stand up to the kids dropping things on it and banging into it and running into it. You don't want something that's going to dent really easily. If you get something like a pine, which has a very small, low Jenka hardness, um, and they vary depending upon what they are, you're going to find you're going to be getting a lot more dense into it. So you might want to look up a couple of the woods and see you know, how hard is it. And some of the times it's a little counterintuitive when you actually compare them. Uh, most of the time, a white oak is going to be harder than a red oak, but not always. There are some white oaks that are softer than red oaks, and there are a few red oaks that are harder than white oaks, which gets a little confusing. Although most of the time that variation isn't going to mean too much. Uh, but then you could be looking at something like cherry. And cherry is a really nice, fun word to work, but it can be a little soft and it dents pretty easily. Um, or some of the mahoganies, uh, like the, the Filipino mahogany, has a very low Jenka number. It is really, really soft. It almost feels like balsa sometimes. Um, and you look at this funny and you're going to get a dent in it. But um, it might have other characteristics you're looking for. So let's actually go back over here. Um, the next most important thing I usually look at is I come down here to the end grain. And you're going to see one of two things here. You're going to see ring porous or you're going to see diffuse porous. And this, this is key. This is very, very, very important, especially when you're working with hand tools. And you're going to hear a lot of other um, porous statements. And you'll hear things like um, oak, what's the word they use? It's uh, um, through porous? No, I can't remember the term. Um, I'll come up against it. The, the technical term, for pores in the wood is either diffuse porous or ring porous. And the way, the big difference in it, here, let me show you, this is actually some English oak. And English oak is a type of white oak. Um, and in this, you will very, very, very clearly see the rings. They're, they're incredibly prominent. But if you get in here really close, and I don't know if I can do this, and focus, you can see that in the rings, in the core, you're actually getting all of the pores, all of the holes, are in the ring itself. And then in between, you have this winter sapwood. Oh, excuse me, that's, that's the, yeah, that's the winter sapwood. Um, and there aren't a lot of holes in there. They're not very porous. And that means that all of your pores are going to be in a line on the ring. And then in between those, you have a much more dense wood. Now, it doesn't seem like much, but that means that you have points at which the wood is naturally going to split. 
it wants to follow those pores because you have big straws there. You have big holes that it can easily follow that ring. But then you get other woods. Um, let me pull out here. Maple. Maple's a good explanation of this. Maple is diffuse porous. And diffuse porous basically means that there are still pores in there. Oop, focus. There are still pores in there, but you're not going to tell a difference from ring to ring to ring. The holes are all the same size throughout the rings. And that means you're going to have a much more homogeneous board. So if it's diffuse porous, it means it's going to be less stringy. There, when you split it, there's going to be less chance it's going to run away with the grain. Whereas a diffuse porous, something like your oaks, your hickory, your oaks, your ash, your, um, your hickory, um, those are going to want to splinter off. Diffuse porous means it's going to be harder to work because you're probably going to get more tear out. You're probably going to get places where the grain wants to run away and you have to, you have to spend a lot more attention uh, working with diffuse porous, uh, with ring porous. Whereas a diffuse porous like your pines and your maples and your walnut and your cherry, uh, those actually are very easy to work because everything holds together. Everything is a bit more homogenous. Um, and so that's, those are the, the two big things you want to look at. I'm going to talk about a couple more here in a moment. Um, but knowing the difference between ring porous and diffuse porous is very important. Um, am I missing, missing anything? Any questions that I, I didn't know in? there was such a difference. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember the other the term that you Is it open cell? Hear. What's that? Someone wrote open cell. Open cell. Oh, yes. Uh, no, not open cell. Um, no, it's not that. It's open porous? No. There's another term that people talk about pores um, that gets very confusing, and it's not correct. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I can't remember what that is. Does that also yeah. come into play when you stain and stuff then too or not? Yes. Um, yes. Sorry if I jumped in. No, that's, that's actually a really good one. Um, when you're going to put a finish onto the wood, if it's, if it's ring porous like an oak, then those spaces with all of the, with all of the pores are going to soak up the, the, the stain and finish much easier than the space in between it. So if you have a ring porous wood and you put finish on it, suddenly that grain is going to pop out and you're going to see a lot of difference between the rings and between the, the spaces in the rings, between the pores and the non-pores. Um, and so with ring porous wood, you're going to have a lot popping out of the finish. With a diffuse porous wood, you're not going to have a lot. You're going to have a bit more homogeneous, a homogeneous finish to it. It's going to be more of an even tone. You're not going to see the rings as much in it. Now, one of the surprising things is, with a diffuse porous surface, you will often get blotchy surfaces. And so if you ever noticed if you're staining a maple, you'll get some spots that get really dark and other spots that get really white, and it doesn't match up with the grain, and there's no, it makes no rhyme or reason to it. It's just an area of the wood that's absorbing it more than another area of the wood. And so if you're working with a diffuse porous wood, you're probably going to want to use a pre-stain. And that will go in there and fill all the pores to the same amount so that when the finish goes on, you get the same coloring on every space. No one space is going to absorb more than another space. But if you're trying to get something that has a lot of figure on it, something that's got a lot of you know, twisting grain and other things that you want to show off, uh, then you're probably going to want to get something that is ring porous because then that grain will really pop out. And that's one of the reasons why um, um, quarter sawn white oak is very valuable as you have the rays, which I might talk about in a little bit. Um, rays do not absorb um, much of any finish at all, and so they stand out as a much lighter color to the wood behind them, and so you get a lot of that contrast coming through. But if you use a pre-stain on quarter sawn white oak, suddenly it's all the same color, and you don't see those grains coming out. So, so depending on your size project, does it really, the ring porous versus diffuse, how much stain you need because of soaking it in? And is it not a noticeable? No, okay. no, and that's one of the, the things when you put finish in, a lot of people will talk about it soaking in. And there is a certain amount that it will soak in, and that depends on how you finish the wood. But a really, really strong, heavy soak in is like a, a 64th of an inch, if that. It's a couple shavings and it, it's out. Um, so a really deep soak in is, is not much at all. Um, so the difference between 
one soaking it up and the other is, is it not measurable. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why if you sand a surface, the, sand, the dust will actually clog the pores, which makes it sound like, ah, that means it's going to stop the finish from going down in. But the exact opposite is true because it actually will wick it and draw it farther into the wood. So if you want to get a slightly deeper penetration, or if you want to see more of that contrasting difference in color, give it a quick sanding just to, just to run a grit over it, and that will actually allow it to soak in a little bit more and you'll get more of that contrast. Um, and vice versa, if you want to get a cleaner, smoother surface on something like maple, then plane it, don't sand it. Uh, and that will keep the dust out of the pores so that you'll get a little bit more even coat on it. Um, so, one of those interesting things. Um, ring porous. Oh, okay, let me switch back over here. Uh, there's a few other things you're gonna see in here. Uh, you'll see straight grain, you will see, uh, you'll, you'll see straight grain, you'll see uh, coarse, uneven texture, you'll see interlocking grain. Um, and those are kind of just talking about the pretty obvious thing. Straight grain has grain that is straight. Um, coarse grain tends to mean that there are very large, um, large grains. You'll often find that in your, your heavy ring porous woods, is that the, 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 well, the grain is it's coarse, it's big. Um, but another one you'll see is interlocking grain. And where is that piece? I had something here that was really good at showing. Where did I set it down? Oh, yeah, here it is. My Filipino mahogany. And with interlocking grain, um, you'll often see these color textures come out. And what we have here is we have a band of wood here, and a band of wood here, and a band of wood here. And each one of those bands, the grain is going a different direction. So right here, the grain is diving in that way. And this one, the grain is actually coming out this way. And so if I'm planing in this direction, uh, this one will look good, and this one will look like tear out. And if I reverse and go this way, this one will look good, and this one will look like tear out. So this interlocking grain, where each grain goes in a different direction, can often be a big problem. Um, also, you know, from the camera's point of view, this one looks dark, and this one looks light. From my point of view, this one looks dark, and this one looks light. It's just the difference of the light is hitting it from a different angle, so it's bouncing off at my eye, different than it's bouncing, bouncing off at your eye. So interlocking grain can often mean you have that sparkle texture between the two, but it can also mean it's going to be a pain to plane because you're always going to be going against the grain. Um, and that's pretty common with a lot of the South American woods, you, especially uh, Paduke and, uh, red and uh, Purple Heart. You'll often find the grain switching and going directions in that some trees actually grow in a spiral pattern. And so because of that, every other year or every few years, that spiral will change. And one direction will be going this way, and the next year it's going the other direction. Um, and so the grains actually crisscross each other as they go up, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, oh, I didn't mention that. This website, I use it quite a bit, um, so the wood database. Um, but it does also come with the book called Wood. Really imaginative. <laughs> Wouldn't you know? Um, but if you've never seen it, it's like it's page after page after page, and every wood, every page, is a fairly detailed list of all the information and a good picture of it. And uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. One of the things they have on here is every page has this description on the bottom here, um, and it says um, possible health risks. And every single wood, doesn't matter what it is, has possible health risks other than not known. <laughs> it's kind of scary. We don't even know how bad this one is. Um, possible wood risks. They all have pretty much the same one. Um, you know, don't breathe in the dust. There's possible health risks. Um, and the book is really, really good. But the website has far more data. Um, and so I'm often using the, the website more. Like the book doesn't have Jenka hardnesses, which I think is kind of janky, um, but uh, oh, I didn't even get a laugh. Oh, sorry. Janky? Um, no. Wasn't, let's see. Wasn't worth it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Here's some of the other things you'll find on here is, let's come down a little ways. You'll see odor. Um, mm -hmm. And some of these woods are very easily identifiable by their odor, especially, you know, red oaks. Um, and uh, some people really hate red oaks. Some people really hate white oaks um, because they have they have order. Um, and then you'll see, you know, come down here to common uses. And this is pretty funny because almost all of them have cabinetry, furniture, interior trim, flooring, 
<laughs> boat building barrel, you, uh, boat building barrels and veneer. That's not not quite as common, but you'll, you'll often see, you know, cabinetry, furniture, interior trim, and flooring on pretty much all of these. Um, yeah, <laughs> and then it gets really, really confusing because there are a lot of gray areas in wood, and I'm not just talking about coloring. I'm talking about I might say that this is wood X, but the tree that grew 10 feet away is the exact same tree, but the wood inside looks completely different. Uh, and so a lot of times you, you may think that I want this particular wood, and then you get to the lumber supply and you find out that that doesn't look like I want it to look. Uh, so a lot of times you just have to go in person and see what did that tree spit out because it can be wildly different, especially when you get into oaks. Because if you have white oak and red oak, here, um, a lot of times red oak looks kind of reddish and white oak looks kind of white oakish. Uh, but there are a lot of white uh, red oaks that look whiter than red oaks and uh, white oaks and white oaks that look redder than they, they can look like the opposite ones. Um, and ring differences on them can be very similar or wildly different. And so, and then you can get into hybrids. Um, like one of the common ones around here is you get swamp oak and bur oak, which are two very distinct different trees. Um, but you can actually get a hybrid of the two because the two can um, interbreed. And you do have a lot of different species that can then interbreed, and you'll get, like, is this a bur oak or a... It really doesn't matter. It's, it's oak. <laughs> oh, and then it gets really confusing, because if you say white oak, there is a specific tree called white oak. But white oak is also a large classification of oaks, because you have your red oaks and your white oaks. And then in the red oak section, which is a large category, there is also a specific tree called red oak. But it's very rare that you actually are using red oak, and it's very rare that you're actually using white oak. You're often using a bur oak or a swamp oak or something else that is also in the white oak family. Um, kind of like uh, um, European, uh, English oak. English oak is a white oak, um, though it often gets separated because it's the only oak when you're in England. Um, yes. <laughs> what questions do we have so far? Um. I'm not sure. What are you going to talk about next? Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is appearances. Okay. So I have one related to stain and like what types of woods for projects. I'm not sure you've talked enough through things. I'll hit that one a little bit. Yeah. Let, keep going and then I'll see. Cool. So then the next thing you have to ask yourself is what do I want the wood to look like? Number one, will it be structurally capable of holding it? Is it hard enough for what I want it? Is it something that's workable as opposed to you know, ring porous as opposed to diffuse porous? Um, is it going to be worth my time grabbing planes or am I driving myself crazy with tear out? Um, the next thing is, does it look good? And that can be wildly different because if I put the exact same boiled linseed oil on all of these woods here, I get wildly different colors. And that's kind of one of those things you have to know from experience because every finish out there is going to impart different coloring to the wood. And every tree out there is going to have a different way that it accepts that coloring. And so I can often say, you know, this color and white oak will give you this finish, but it could be that a slightly different white oak gives me a slightly different finish with the exact same finish on it. That gets really, ah. Uh, and then you have time changes. So something like cherry. Cherry. Oh, cherry is so nice to work. It's hand tool friendly. A little on the soft side, but really easy to work with. And it's got this really nice golden tone to it. Beautiful wood. And then it sits out. And a year later, you come back and it's kind of more of a, a muddy gold. And then a year later, it's almost like a... Well, it's brown. And then a little later, later it gets darker. And then, you know, a few years into it, it's walnut. Uh, cherry changes pretty drastically over the years, and especially when it gets into the sunlight. Uh, when you're in Paducah and Purple Heart, uh, these are just gorgeous woods. They have so much color, and you know Paducah and Purple Heart, and they look great. Um, but if you if you don't seal them with a UV sealer, any UV that gets on them will slowly turn them brown and really, really brown. Um, purple, uh, purple Heart particularly will turn um, almost a walnut color. 
Um, and then, you know, here's What's the one that turned like copper. Is that just from sitting? These are these actually came off the exact same board. Um, this one has just been in the light. This one has been underneath something. So actually, I can turn this, and you can see the coloring there is much closer to the coloring there. And that's just time that's gotten into the board. And so you have to know this particular tree with this particular finish in this particular setting is going to turn this particular color. And if you change any one of those particulars, you're going to get a different color. <laughs> that's what makes finish really fun. So um, yeah, a lot of that is you just got to have trial and error. You get to know oak, you get to know this particular wood, and you know that if I put that finish on, I'm probably going to be getting something close to this. Um, and you often will be happy and you often will be like, wow, I got something very different this time. <laughs> so the, the best course of action I can get is some lumber yards will actually allow you to have scraps. Um, a lot of them will have the, the scrap pile out back or the, the, the junk pile that they have cutoffs. And you can take a scrap back and actually stain it and see, is this what I want it to be? And play around with that. Um, a lot of them don't have that. And so you just got to kind of guess with it. Usually the best way to do it is once you've chosen your lumber and you've got your mind on what finish you want to get, you use the scraps from that lumber and you do several tests and you try out on that particular board you have, how is this finish going to look? And try different ways of applying it and different types of applying it to try and get that color you're looking for. Because, yeah, it's a bit of trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> so does the wood database talk about that at all or not, not really? really because there are so many types of finishes out there um, you, you can't just say you know with oil finish you're going to get a darker tone and some of the but wood does it talk about like cherry changing uh, yeah it will talk about some of the aspects of expect this color to change actually let me just go to cherry and see if it's in there because uh, I've seen it on a few of them where it will give that general idea uh, let's see what we get here to cherry. Yeah. And which cherry are we talking about? And around here we have a lot of black cherry. And the color that comes on here is this really light golden color. Um, but if you let this sit out in the sun for a couple years, it'll be dark brown. Um, and so it's the exact same thing. This is the raw wood and the, the database will show you what the raw color looks like. Um, color and appearance. Brown. Uh, when freshly cut, darkening to a medium reddish brown with time and exposure to light. Um, Sapwood, pale yellowish. So it does give some change on that one. Um, let me see if this one has finish. Yeah. Semi ring porous um, to diffuse porous. So sometimes you'll actually see rings with, the, uh, with the, the, the holes big enough you can see, but most of the time it's going to be a diffuse porous. Small to medium pores, meaning that the holes that it does have are going to be hard to see. And if they're hard to see, it means they're not going to split along as well. A rot resistance, um, and some of these will actually tell you, yeah, it decays some, and some will say, yeah, this one actually just doesn't decay very long. Let um, me go down here to common uses. Cabinetry, fine furniture, flooring, interior millwork, <laughs> the exact same things. Veneer, every wood out there is listed as veneer because at some point someone has made a veneer out of that wood. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a great way to go in there and say, you know, I have access to these five different woods. Let's look at the characteristics on this and it'll give me an idea. Is it going to be something that is durable for what I want? Is it going to be something that is easy to work or hard to work? In other words, ring porous, diffuse porous. Um, is it going to be, you know, the right tones and aspects that I'm looking for? And uh, a lot of that is experimentation and experience. Uh, the only way you're really going to know is having it in your shop and playing with it and the finishes that you like to use. Um, so yeah, if you can get scraps, get scraps and play with them. Um, if not, um, take your best guess. Or get onto the hive mind and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting this wood. Does it have any aspects that I need to know about? Does it change colors? Um, and if you, like with Purple Heart and Paduke and some of the other colors, um, you can actually save the color if you put a UV coating on it, something that will stop the UV from getting to it. You can keep the color a little longer. It won't be quite as vibrant, um, but it will stay much better. And you can get wood in 
pretty much any color. Like uh, Osage Orange is a very light orangish color, and the, the root of Osage Orange is actually Osage Green, and it is a very green, vibrant green, really kind of cool to play with. Um, hard to get because it's just in the, the root, um, but very, very beautiful. So that UV thing, protector, is that something you can get anywhere? Or? Um, there are different finishes that will protect against UV. You'll see some UV um, rated polys. Um, there are, I haven't seen a UV rated varnish, I'm pretty sure. Well, I yeah, there, okay, yes, there like are there are plenty, there's uh, marine grade varnishes. Um, almost all marine grade varnishes are UV uh, finishes. Um, you'll get a lot of epoxy finishes that you can get with UV. Um, but you'll have to look at the particular one, and it'll, it'll, it, if it's, if it's UV resistant, it will tell you because it's a good selling point. <laughs> but it's not like just something by itself; it's mixed in this. Yeah, thing. no, okay. it's uh, that particular finish you want on there. Um, yeah. So, what questions we got? Are you going to go on any more? Yeah, tangents? I'm going to transition over to questions, and that'll probably okay. take me to a tangent or so two. So, I didn't necessarily sort the questions. Sure. I'm just going to go do it. them as I fold them out. Um, let's see. C. Joe asked, I've got a bunch of ash. Would it be okay for a workbench top or should I use it for the legs instead and get soft maple for the top? Yes, um, ash is actually, um, ash is fairly similar to most oaks. Let me just do it here, A-S-H. Uh, so we're gonna come over here to ash. Now there's a bunch of different types of ash, of course. Um, green ash, white ash, blue ash, pumpkin ash. <laughs> um, Let's go with uh, white ash. That is one that I use. Um, and the Jenka hardness on this is 1300. Um, so it's a little bit softer than white oak. It's about the hardness of a red oak. Um, and ash can um, be all sorts of things. It is a, a ring porous wood with very large pores. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would treat it for most cases anything like I would treat an oak. Um, it is a very durable uh, resistant wood mm -hmm. however it is hard to work because it is very ring porous and so that means that it's going to be splintering off. You've got to watch out for tear out. Um, make sure you're going with the grain at all times. Um, but that being said it's a relatively durable wood. It's going to stand up to a lot of abuse. Um, it is a very light colored wood and it stays very light colored. Um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't darken as much as other color, other woods. Um, that's one of the things you might look in here is you'll see, I mean, where is tannin? Uh, you'll see um, sometimes they have a tannin containing a lot of oaks. Most all oaks have a lot of tannin in them. And that means that they're going to tend to get a little bit more of a, a golden, richer tone as they age a little bit. Uh, whereas ash, which has a very similar grain structure to oak, doesn't have much tannin in it. And so it doesn't actually change a little bit darker. Another thing you'll see in there quite a bit is silica content. Some woods have a lot of silica, and that will dull your plane blades very quickly. It's basically like sand in the wood. And so you imagine taking your plane over sandpaper, that's what it's gonna do with some woods. Uh, like Ipe. Ipe is an incredibly dense wood. Let me look this one up. I-P-E, if I remember correctly, right? I-P-E, Ipe? Yes, I-P-E, I got it. <laughs> Ipe, um, Jenka hardness, 3,500. This thing is, is hard as rock. Uh, let me see down here. Um, the color can vary, and it does actually vary quite a bit. Grain texture, it has a fine to medium texture. Um, diffuse porous. Trying to find, uh, come on, this one has silica, where is it? Difficult word to work. Yeah, that's putting it lightly. So have you worked with EP? Uh, a few times. Um, one of the scraps I have. Uh, this actually came from the... Um, you made a handle, didn't SV you? Seeker project. I probably made quite a few things out of it. Um, but EK, I, I didn't see it in here. I have to, I have to search for it. Um, has a large silica content. So even though it's very hard, which will naturally dull the blades, because of the silica content in here, it will dull it even faster. So you're realizing that you're looking through this and you're gonna to have to be sharpening your blades constantly with this because it's very, very hard. Um, and it is diffuse porous, so the, the rings, you can't see a difference in the holes on the rings. Um, and so it is a fairly homogeneous one, uh, but this does tend to split out more than most 
ring porous, uh, more than most diffuse porous woods. Um, and so you can see on the, the end grain here, you don't see the rings as much, so you don't see the, all of the, the pores in there. But you will still get some tear out from it um, because it just tends to be a very stringy wood. And you know that just that will also say that no matter how much you look at this, if you see diffuse porous, it doesn't mean that it's going to be guaranteed to be a really nice, easy wood to work. That means that it's probably going to be an easier wood to work than a corresponding wood that's ring porous. But there are some that are wildly different, and so sometimes you just have to experiment and play with it and realize, ooh, that's not what I thought it was. <laughs> What's next? Excuse me, sorry. Um, let's see, Chuck Bush. Now you just got a whole bunch of questions, so I'm not even sure cool. I'm going to get through all of these. Um, he has, I finally scored an old bro okay. at a flea market, but it needs a new handle. In my area, maple, oak, and ash are common. Which of these would you choose to make a handle for a fro? Oh, any of those would be great. Um, with a fro, you're going to have a lot of twisting force. And so you want something that is has a, a nice rigid form to it, but also is a little bit springy so that when you push on it, it's going to bend a little bit rather than breaking. Um, and oak and ash are very good for that. Um, hickory is generally considered to be the best because it has a really nice flexibility to its hardness comparison. Um, I, I would go with the oak or ash over the maple. Um, because the maple is um, diffuse porous, it tends to splinter easier. Um, it doesn't resist the, uh, the, the twisting quite as much. Um, so ring porous tends to be a lot stronger for handles because anytime you're trying to pry on it and bend with it, it actually is a little bit stronger in that manner. What is a fro? Uh, a fro is uh, an axe with a weird handle. Okay, that's all. Is, is that the one with the long one that kind of curves ah, at the bottom? Fro. Uh, no. No. This okay. is a fro. Oh. Um, so the blade is here, and you use that, you jam it down into the wood, and you twist the handle. And as you twist it, you're actually s splitting it, and so it can actually drive that split down um, and you use it for making um, sh cedar shakes, roofing shingles, and things of that nature. All right. This one is actually made out of, um, I don't know what that is. It's probably locust. What's next? Uh, let's see. See, Joe said, I've never, I heard to never use porous wood for cutting boards because it gets stained more than the stuff like maple. That's an old wives' tale. Um, no. Yeah, there, there's a, there is a, a lot of people who say don't use a ring porous wood for cutting boards because it can soak up juices and then you get those juices down in the wood. Um, the truth of the matter is all woods are porous. All woods will soak up about the same amount. Um, it really doesn't matter if it's diffuse or ring porous, they all do it. Um, and it's not going to make a difference of how deep it goes um, or how dangerous it is. It's an old wives' tale. And uh, totally, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> so Brandon Chenault wants to know um, with different woods how that affects wood stability and then like different woods movement more than others. Can you say it one more time? So wood stability and how different woods move more than others. Um, usually, general rule of thumb, the harder the wood, the less it's going to move. The reason being is that the harder the wood is, usually the heavier the wood is. And the heavier the wood is, that means the more wood that there is packed in there. And the more wood that there's packed in there, the less chance moisture is going to get in there, expand, the less pores there are for that twisting to happen. So a harder wood generally is going to be more stable than a soft wood. Generally. Um, but most of the time the stability comes from individual tree to individual tree and individual cutting to individual cutting. If you, were, if you came from a tree that was under a lot of force from the wind, it was always leaning and all of its force is trying to bend back, you're going to get a lot of natural stress in that wood trying to bend it back. Then you cut it down the middle and suddenly your board goes plink. 
um, because you're suddenly releasing all of that stress. And it could be from that particular tree and has nothing to do with the type of wood. Um, so most of the time, um, stability is tree to tree. But generally, the harder it is, the more stable it'll be. Um, the softer it is, the less stable it'll be. But again, that's wild generality. Generality, something like that. What's next? Um, did you cover burls and stuff like you said you were going to? Um, no. Um, I, I kind of touched on it with uh, grain. Where did that board go? Ah, here we are. This is a white oak, and this is uh, curl. And when you start getting into grains, you're going to hear all sorts of different names. But basically, this is a compression where the grain, rather than running a straight line, zigzags up. And that's from the tree being compressed or being under stress. Uh, you'll see this a lot of times in woods that are along walkways and paths, um, where the, the root structure underneath is, is, is stressed, and so it'll be crushing up. Or you'll see other times where the wind has been bending it, and the grain will be actually like accordioning, 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 going zigzaggy up the side as the tree is bending and literally scrush, crushing all those fibers in the side. Um, and you have, in order to get that, you have to cut it a certain way. If you cut it the other way, you won't see the zigzag because now they're going in and out of the grain as opposed to um, zigzagging where you can see it. Um, and so it's the same thing with, with quarter sawing. You have to make sure you saw it in the direct, great direction so you see the rays. Uh, burls, though, are usually a place where infection has gotten under the tree or some damage has happened and the, <clears throat> the tree grows around it. But as the tree grows around it, the tree never really grows back into itself straight. Often it does, and then you'll get this straight grain going on. You'll see that often along um, knots in the wood, where the wood just grows around it and it meets up on the other side. Um, or if a, a tree limb is cut off, eventually it will grow up around it. You might get a little bump in there, but you won't get a burl. Burls happen when it doesn't meet and something goes wrong, or an infection stops it from meeting. Um, or it just grows back in and kind of misses itself and starts twisting up. And you'll, there's a lot of different reasons for different burls to occur. And so you get this tree that just gets a malfunction growing off the side of it. Um, and you get this grain that's going every different direction inside there. There is no direction to it because it's all just twisting around itself. And that gives you really cool characteristics to look at. The problem is because the grain is going all over the place, it's not very strong. Um, now, normally when you're working with burl, you don't need it to be very strong because a burl is not very big, and so it's not large enough to be a structural item. But that's something to be thinking about. You don't really want to put burl in a place where it's going to be stressed because there isn't a whole lot holding it together. A lot of those pieces tend to, there even tends to be air pockets inside there. Um, so that can be a bit of an issue. What's next? Let's see. Um, did Harold Golden asked if you were going to talk about shrinkage of different species of wood also. Um, yeah, that falls pretty closely to the, uh, the um, warping and, uh, and changing. Okay, I thought so. Usually the harder it is, the more stable it's going to be, um, but not necessarily. Um, and that's one of the things, whenever you're laminating two pieces together, you want to make sure that they have about the same amount of expansion contraction speed. Um, and I don't think the word database has that because it's a really hard thing to measure. Let's see if it has it on here. Um, oh, yeah, it does. Uh, here we go. Uh, so this one has uh, shrinkage. So radial, tangentially, and uh, volumetric. Uh, and so you can actually see um, how this is going to expand and contract with moisture. Um, and so with that, if you're going to be laminating two woods together, especially if they're going to be long, you want to make sure that those are going to expand and contract together. If you have a very hard wood with a very soft wood, you're often going to see that there's a very different um, expansion contraction rate on there. And so you're going to get this lamination where one bends into the other because one will expand and contract more than the other one will. So you tend to get this banana effect. But that is something to think about. Um, let's see, Justin Walk asked, what type of finishes and best uses do you find for leopard wood? I have never used leopard wood. Um, best uses? Um, 
cabinetry, furniture, Ooh. flooring, <laughs> veneer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, finish, it really just depends on the look you want on it. Um, finish is not something that is, there's a particular, this finish works really well with that wood. It just depends on what texture do you want. Do you want glossy? Do you want satin? Do you want to feel the wood? Do you want to have a, a hard finish over top of it? Um, do you want to add color into it? Do you want it to be blonde? Do you want it to be a natural color? Um, do you want it to be a dry color? Um, there's lots of different things you can... Um, you can go into it and there really isn't any best it's a very personal choice so experiment have some fun and see what you get as i say the overall arching theme of this is trial and error yes <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah it's one of the um, if you ever go to a wood craft there's usually a big um, crate just inside the door that has all sorts of crazy scraps yeah um, and Buy some of those scraps and play with them. You know, try some finishes on it. Run the plane over it. Cut them with a saw. Experiment. See what does this feel like. This is this particular hardness with this particular grain density, and it it feels like this. It works like that. And the next time you're thinking about a wood, you can try and find something that's pretty similar, and you start to get an idea about what this is going to feel like. So if you can look at the database, we'd see some of the aspects of what it is. You can kind of get an idea of what it's going to feel like and what it's going to do before you actually play with it. But a lot of that is just experimentation and experience. So don't be afraid to have fun. <laughs> Let's see. Richard Buckman asks, does the U, U, I don't know if he's trying to say UV protection affect the size of the pieces or what? the unprotection? I'm so confused now that I read it. I Richard don't know. Buckman, retype your question for Can me. Can you clarify? Something about size of the pieces. I, it's not making sense now that I read it out loud. Okay. okay, we'll come back to that one. What's next? Samuel's Custom Builds. What is the most toxic wood species? <laughs> um, there, yeah, the, um, poison ivy. Don't work with poison ivy. Um, yeah. You're going to hear a lot of different things one way or the other. Um, a big scary one is walnut. Uh, there are a lot of people. That was the one that I would pick. There are a lot of people who are drastically allergic to walnut. Um, another thing you uh, are allergic to walnuts. Um, another thing you often hear is don't ever put walnut shavings in your compost um, because um, very few things can actually grow around walnut trees um, because their droppings. Um, put several chemicals into the ground um, that inhibit things from growing. And that's also the same chemical that people often have allergic reactions to. Now, the thing is that chemical can be found all throughout the tree. However, um, it's almost all in the leaves, the bark, and the nuts. There is almost none of it in the tree itself. There is a very trace amount, um, but there are very, very few... Uh, it, it's. If people are allergic to nuts, there's an extremely low chance that they would be allergic to the wood and they would have to eat it to get that allergic reaction. And it's the same thing with shavings. The shavings have such a low amount, they're not going to hurt your, uh, your compost. Um, so a lot of times when you have that, uh, let's know, oh, the, uh, the mango. Mango is also very similar um, with the, uh, um, the leaves and the bark of mango is um, poisonous to a lot of people, but the wood itself, it's fine. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. And, and then, of course, you look at the database, and uh, all of them have the health safety rating of um, working with pine in general can cause... Oh, this is just pine. Uh, working in pine uh, can cause disease, lung function, allergic reaction, bronchial asthma, but okay, so here's my or question. Or dermatitis. Now. Okay, no, no, no. But here's my question. This is the nurse in me coming out. They are not um, making a delineation between power tool working and sawdust being mm -hmm. created and hand planing. Yes. Because it does affect the lungs very differently. And that's, that's the next thing is most of the time, the problem is not the wood itself. Most of the time, it is a mechanical issue with the size of the particulate. And that gets into your lungs and it, it tears things up. Um, it, it can give you an allergic reaction because it actually gets into your pores. 
Um, and you can have a mechanical allergy as opposed to a chemical allergy. Um, and yeah, you work with power tools, you're going to get a lot more dust and you're going to have a lot more problems with it. Whereas with hand tools, you get chips and shavings and, and heavy sawdust that falls quickly. So you're really not going to be running into as much problem with hand tools as you would with power tools. But with power tools, no matter what wood you should be working with, have a respirator. You should be you know, really protecting your lungs. Um, and some woods, um, like the Filipino mahogany, this stuff is incredibly soft. When you cut this with a saw, the dust comes out of this really, really fine. Um, and so I find when I'm doing a decent amount of cutting with this, I put on my respirator, even though I'm using um, hand tools, because the dust from that can actually be irritating. Though if I'm just making a cut or two, it's, it's you know, that much. But if I were using this with power tools, I would have serious air protection going on because of the particulate. Now, does this particular wood have any allergic reaction because of the chemical makeup of it? No. Um, but the particulate size that comes off of it can be very annoying. So, As always, talk to your physician. <laughs> What's next? Glad you put that disclaimer in there. <laughs> okay, that clarification on Richard Buckman's question. So he wanted to know if putting UV protection on wood like Paducah or Purple Heart um, would affect the width when you try to put things together like you're building. Oh, if you want to pre-finish. Um, generally, if you're going to pre-finish and you want to put one thing inside another, don't put finish on it. Um, if it goes inside of it, it should have glue, not finish. Um, but it depends on the finish. Some finishes, like a, a poly, really don't have a whole lot of thickness to it, so you might get away with that. If you're talking a thickness like an epoxy, that's going to have a lot of thickness to it, so yeah, you need to work that through. Um, but most of the time you want to finish afterwards and do it all together, um, but there are times to do it pre and post, so yeah, it depends on the finish. Some do, some don't. What's next? Um, okay, uh, let's see. Fly Fishing Chief asks, got a piece of ambrosia and it seems pretty dense and heavy. Is it a good choice for a mallet head? I'm assuming you're talking ambrosia maple. Um, ambrosia is um, a coloring that can happen to several different woods. Um, very common in maple, occasionally in poplar. Um, and it's a, it's a, um, yeah, it, it falls into the same char characteristic of um, grain textures because it's an aspect that can go onto the wood. If it's maple, then yes, that's a really heavy, good wood. But again, then you're talking about what's the best wood. Um, I've got live oak, I've got pine, I have oak, I have cherry, and I use each of them for something different. Cherry is softer, and so I use this for my finishing, so I'm not going to be denting up my work. Um, I have a live oak that I use for my carving, incredibly hard, incredibly durable, um, and I can bang on this all day long and not have any problem. My main joinery is white oak. It's something that is a lot more durable, um, and so it just depends on what are you going to be using it for. Sometimes you want a soft mallet, sometimes you want a hard mallet, sometimes you want a mallet that is going to deform and blister all over the place. Like uh, I have this one with maple faces and this one with pine faces. Um, so it just depends on what do you want to use it for. There is no best wood or good wood or bad wood. Um, it depends on the type of mallet you want. So have fun. It sounds like a really pretty mallet, though. How many more we got? Uh, just a couple. All right, we'll finish them then. All right. I like waffles asked. I recently started work working with hardwood after using only pine. My first choice was poplar. Do you have any recommendations for other cheap hardwoods for fellow Illinoisans? <laughs> uh, depends on where you're at. Um, try and find your local sawyers. You can be really surprised at what you get. Sometimes you can actually buy green wood from them, so you have to actually dry it yourself. Uh, but you can find um, really decent deals, like uh, quarter sawn white oak for you know, a buck a board foot. Um, because it's green and you have to do the drying yourself and wait for it, but uh, then, hey, it's a great deal. Um, but if you're going to like Menards and other big box stores, um, you actually have a pretty decent selection at Menards. Menards is, is one of those weird places where it's, it's a good one. You can get oak and aspen and maple and mahogany um, and uh, um, uh, uh, poplar. Um, there's several other woods you can actually get there as well. 
And so you have a decent selection there. Um, but poplar is a really nice wood, very easy to work. It's very soft. Uh, there are some softwoods that are actually harder than poplar, and poplar is a hardwood. Um, hardwood and softwood are deciduous trees or hardwood. Coniferous trees and um, pines and firs are softwood. And so you can have softwoods that are harder than hardwoods and hardwoods that are softer than hardwoods. The softest wood in the world, balsa, is a hardwood. I know, mind-blowing. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're all, they all have their pros and cons and depending upon what you want to build and what you want them to look like, um, have fun with it. Poplar's a really good one to learn on though, really nice. It's way easier than white oak, let me just say. <laughs> I can speak from experience on this one. My puny muscles for this. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> Poplar's much better. <laughs> So let's see, uh, Aiden Muhammad asks, um, can I make a turning saw out of cedar? Yes, theoretically. You might have to make it a little bit more beefy. Um, cedar is a bit softer, well, it's a very soft wood. Um, also, it tends to break easily. Um, it's a diffuse porous that just, it, it doesn't have much tensile strength, so once it comes, those fibers just sever. Um, and so if you're doing something like the turning saw and these arms are under a lot of pressure, eh, cedar might break off. Um, but if you make it thicker and make the arms bigger, then you might have enough that it would withstand it. Um, cedar would be nice and lightweight. It'd be easy to move around. It'd be nice for it. Um, it would be softer, so you'd have a problem with denting it. Um, but theoretically, yeah. Um, this one's out of walnut. I haven't decided what I'm gonna make um, the one that we're doing the main live. Oh, speaking of which, I didn't talk about that. Uh, we are doing um, a live, not this Saturday, but the next one. What's the one after that? No, wasn't it August? Um, 17th? 7th? It's the one right before the live with Kurt Rex. August 7th, it? okay. Uh, we are actually making a turning saw. Actually, I'm going to make a coping saw. Um, and I'm using a kit from Tay Tools. Um, and so if you wanna follow along, this is gonna be a Saturday video on the main channel. And we do one of these once or twice a year. And it's going to be a live build where I build the project all the way through in one go, usually two to four hours-ish. Um, and so we're gonna be devoting a whole time and you can actually build along entirely from beginning to end in one sitting. Um, so if you wanna do that, you can buy the same kit I'm using from Tay Tools. There's a link in the description to this. Um, as well as it's pinned in the comments, I believe. Um, you can also get it from Tools for Working Wood. The Grammar C kit is very similar. Um, and then hopefully tomorrow or the next day, I'm gonna actually be drawing out um, uh, patterns of what I'm gonna be using, and I'll have those on my website so you can download those for free um, and build along with me. Um, and I'll, I'll have decided by that time what I want to make it out of. I will not be making it out of palm, which is actually a grass, not a wood but uh, people use it like a wood and it's, it's crazy. And this is one of the interesting things, palm. Palm is neither diffuse porous nor is it ring porous. It is just porous. <laughs> and yeah, there's no ring structure to it. It's just dots. Um, it's really weird stuff. Hideous and horrible in every way, shape and form. <laughs> and yes. Um, yeah, uh, so is that the last one? Uh, yeah. Cool then I think that will about do it. Um, if anyone has any questions that I didn't get, feel free to send me a message and uh, we'll be having lots of fun between now and then. Yeah, I know someone had a question about the Discord message, James. So. Cool. Well, we will uh, do it next week. I'm not sure what we'll be doing next week, but we'll have some fun. So until then, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.